How to avoid disaster. Oh, boy. You know, uh, two weeks ago we talked about how to avoid respectable sins, and this week we want to talk about how to avoid disaster. Um, not all disaster is avoidable. You do know that, correct? I mean, you can't... Uh, tornado, I mean, a tornado comes, a tornado comes. Now, uh, we were on vacation, and we were out in Colorado, and uh, my boys looked out the window and said, Dad, there's a tornado. And I looked out the window, and I said, no, that's just a low-hanging cloud. It came down to a little point. I said, this looked like a little, all of a sudden, I saw trees going up. <laughs> the bottom part of that tornado was like invisible. But the trees going up into it, and I said, whoa. So to this day, my kids call tornadoes, low-hanging clouds. <laughs> hey, Dad, there's a low-hanging cloud. So what did I do? Well, I immediately got my kids into a safe place to avoid disaster, and then I went out to watch it. <laughs> now, isn't that what any bright person would do? Probably not. You see, you can avoid disaster, or you can put your way, yourself in the way of disaster. And I think that's what Amos has been going after in his book here as we move on to this next chapter. He's going to tell us four ways to avoid disaster. And the first way to avoid disaster is hear the word. Hear the word. Hear this word. Now, Amos is a prophet of God. And the prophet is getting a special revelation from God himself. It is the word of the Lord. His whole job is to be the mouthpiece to speak the word of the Lord. Now, when that was written down, it was inscribed, it became scripture. And all scripture is inspired of God. The word inspired means God breathed. God breathed. God told the prophet what to say, and when he said it and wrote it down, that very word was the word that God wanted spoken. Now, when he says, hear this word, of course he wants you to hear it, okay? So sometimes I encourage people to actually take their phone out and you go to the phone app that has the Bible on it and you hit the little icon that says sound on it and it reads you your Bible. Wow, is this amazing? All right, you can do that. You, you can get the app, and it'll, it'll read it right to you. You can, through your Bluetooth or whatever way you hook up to your car, you can be driving along and having it go through all the speakers, and you can hear God's Word speaking to you. He wants you to hear it. But I think there's even more than just hearing it. The idea in this passage is going to be not to just be a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the Word. And so the word hear is that richer form called hearken, uh, obey it, do the word. He says, hear the word, hear this word, O house of Israel. And he says, this lament. Now, now, a lament is a funeral dirge. And so he's saying, listen, I've gotten this message from God, and he could almost sing it as a funeral dirge because someone is dying. Guess who? Oh, house of Israel. House of Israel. They've been practicing all their respectable sins, and they've been thinking, making very light of it, very light of it. And God was about to visit the nation Israel with his chastening hand, and he says, take up this lament concerning you. You. You know, if we would just listen like when I had a fire stove insert in my home in Ohio, and I'd put the logs in it, and it was hot, and I'd tell the kids, stay away from that, it's hot. I gave them the warnings, and sure enough, one of them would go and touch it, just to see if it was hot. Listen. Then they come bawling, because they just got a little blister on their finger, because it was too hot. Well, 
You were told, you were warned, and that's what this is. Hear this word of the Lord, O Israel, this lament concerning you, and here it is. Fallen is virgin Israel. Hmm. Normally we think of the term of virgin as being pure. The text here I think is saying virgin Israel, she is, Israel had not yet fulfilled her purpose. She had not yet blossomed, and God had so much more for Israel, but she has fallen never to rise again, deserted in her own land with no one to lift her up. Why? She had not avoided the disaster. She was doing, she was touching the hot stove. We do this all the time. We know what the word, the word of the Lord is. We know the Ten Commandments. We know the Great Commandment. The love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And, and, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. But then we still put ourselves first. And make it all about me. Fallen is virgin Israel. She is fallen. Listen, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. The city marches out a thousand strong for Israel will only have a hundred left. Whoa. There is a 90% loss. In fact, when God finally sent his chastening hands and he used the Assyrians, they came into the land and they conquered the land. They transported out of the land like 90%, left a little remnant in the land. They brought in these Gentiles into the land. They co-mingled. And that's how we come up with the group that's called the Samaritans to this day. The town that marches out 100 strong will only have 10 left. They had a 90% loss. I wonder sometimes how great our loss has to be before we say, oh my, I need to turn this thing around. I need to just listen to the Lord so the chastening hand of God is not upon me. It's amazing God only asks us to give him 10%, right? That's a tithe. But how many of us want to fudge on that? Is that off the top or is that on my take home? <laughs> what if the Lord were to say, listen, I'm going to just let you live on 10%. I'll take the 90. Ooh. That is exactly what was happening to the nation of Israel. They refused to listen to the Lord. And the Lord said, whoa, hear this word. Hearken unto it. The second thing we've got to do, we've got to hear the word of the Lord. We've got to know what the Lord wants, and then we've got to do it. The second thing here is we have to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek him who gives life. I don't know, any of you ever played hide and seek? Come on, I want to see some hands. Anybody played recently, like with the grandkids? It is so much fun, especially when they're like toddlers. You almost hide in plain sight, and they can't even see you. you got to start making noises, all right? The older they get, the harder you have to hide, okay? And so it's a hide-and-seek. So in hide-and-seek, the seeker is actually looking for the person who is hidden, right? It's looking. I have a favorite verse on look. It's found in Isaiah 45, verse 22. It says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. Whoa. That's a powerful verse. That's just a powerful verse. On January 6th, in 1850, a young man by the name of Charles was going to church. It was a snowy day, a terrible snowy day. He was going to the church where his, pastor, his father pastored. But it was nine miles away. When was the last time you walked nine miles to go to church on a winter day? Whoa. Well, the storm was so bad, he couldn't make it. So at uh, going down, uh, down, down the, the lane, the street there, he could hear some music coming from the primitive Methodist church. And so he ducked inside. He slid into the last row. The storm was so bad, the preacher didn't show up. So a layman got up. He went up and he, and he went up to the, the Bible that was on the front of the church. 
And it just so happened to be open to Isaiah 45. He looked down the passage, saw verse 22. And so the layman began to preach at the place of the preacher. Is this amazing? Suppose I didn't show up next Sunday. Which one of you are going to step in? He looked at verse 45, 22, and he says, Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. He didn't have much to say. That's a short verse. For I am God, there is none else. He said, God is wonderful. He's our creator. There's none else. No other God but our God. You've got to look to him. And he said, you got to look, you got to look. And he looked at that young man, Charles, in the last row, and he pointed at his finger at him, and he said, look, young man, you're in big trouble. Look to the Lord. you got to look to the Lord. you got to look to the Lord. You're in trouble. Now, imagine I did that to you some Sunday morning. How would that make you feel? <laughs> that is the day that Charles Haddon Spurgeon accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and became the Prince of Preachers of the 19th century. His writings and his works are still read to this day. God saved him. The moment he really looked, his search was over. You see, seek him in who gives you life. Watch what the text says. He is saying to the nation Israel, this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You need to seek him, the way, the truth, and the life. You need to seek the Lord. And I don't know, if you're, if you're going to avoid disaster, you're, you're going to have to begin by seeking the Lord, looking for Him until you find Him. He said, do not seek Bethel or do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. Now, if you do a little research, you'll find that these were all holy places in Old Testament times. Bethel was a worship center. Gilgal was a worship center. It's where they rolled away the reproach of, of Egypt when they came into the land. Beersheba goes all the way back to Abraham. Abraham, uh, he worshiped the Lord at, at Beersheba. And, and these are all holy places. He says, don't go to those places because it's just mere formalism. It's like saying, don't get up and go to Bethany and just go through the motions. Seek the Lord, not the ritual. Seek the Lord. So why? He says, for Gilgal will surely go into exile. Bethel will, not, will be reduced to nothing. He said, listen, it's not a matter of place. It's not even a matter of time. Sunday morning, 10 a.m. It's a matter of your heart. Are you seeking the Lord? Are you saying, Lord... Speak to me. I want to hear your word. Speak to my heart. Seek the Lord. You seek the Lord. You seek him who gives life, but you also need to seek him who takes life because Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. They're going to be carried away into captivity. Sometimes I think we forget into whose presence we enter when we come into the presence of the Lord. God told Moses, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. When was the last time you went into the presence of the Lord and said, oh my goodness, I've got to get down on my face before God. God who gives life, God who takes life. He goes on and he says, seek the Lord and live. He, he said the second time, this is right, seek the Lord and, and you'll live. In a time of disaster, if you'll seek the Lord, you will live. Or, if you don't seek the Lord, watch what happens. Or he will sweep through the house of Joseph. Well, that sounds pretty good. He's just going to clean things up. Until you read the rest of that verse. He's going to sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. Now, fire is a term often used as an image of the judgment of God. For our God is a consuming fire, and he is holy. He said, be holy, for I am holy. And he's expecting that. And so seek him who sweeps with his judgment. 
It devours, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. Whoa. You will not be able to stand, withstand the chastening hand of God when the chastening hand of God strikes. Seek him. Avoid the disaster. Seek him now. He turns from hearing the word and seeking the Lord to now seeking the good. Seeking the good. Three things you can do to avoid disaster. He first starts by saying, who should seek him? He says, you who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. Those who are unjust in their dealings, they're cheats. They're harsh. They're cruel. They're unjust. Kind of sounds like our court system today. We let bad people get off, and good people pay a price. Wow. Same thing going on back then. Who should seek him? Those who are unjust. Who else should seek him? Well, they should be seeking him because he is the creator. He who made the Pleiades and Orion. You know, these are star constellations in the sky. And Ryan's my favorite. I pick him out every night when I jump in the hot tub and it's a clear sky. I look up, I can always spot Orion. And the Bible refers to Orion. And I say, God, you put that there. To remind me you're the creator. Not only did he create them, he created you and me. He goes on and he says, he's in control of his creation. He's the one who turns blackness into dawn and darkness into night. He's the one that turns a daylight on and a daylight off. He calls the water of the sea and he pours them out over the face of the earth. You go all the way back to the first book of the Bible in Genesis and God said, let there be water and there was. <laughs> God is the one who's in control. He calls. He's the one who saves. He says, it's the Lord. The Lord is his name who does all this. He creates, he controls, he calls. Listen, listen. His name is Lord. I got it up there. The Tetragrammaton, the four letters. The Y-H-W-H. -H. The Yod, the He, the Vav, the He. The four letters. So when Moses was at that burning bush and Moses was being reluctant, God is calling him to go and he doesn't want to go and he says, I don't even know who you are. What's your name? I'm supposed to go tell people... Uh, Hey, let, let God's people go from their slavery. And, and I don't even know. They're going to say, who? Who's this God you're talking about? He said, I don't even know your name. And he says, I am that I am. Eh, yeah, eh, yeah. Comes from this word. That's where this name comes from. I am who I am. There's no tense in Hebrew. So it is, I was that I was. I am that I am. I will be that I will be. I am the self-existent God. I exist of myself. Always was, always will be, always am. I exist totally different from you, and I am your saving God. Go deliver my people. Seek the good, he says. You've got to seek the Lord. The Lord is his name, the Lord who saves. He will flash destruction on the stronghold and bring the fortified city to ruin. This is the God, the saving God, who also is the destroying God. He is the destroying God. Who should seek him? Gets back to that. He said who should seek him, then he said why you should seek him. Now he's saying who should seek him? You who hate. The one who reproves in court. Mm. You hate the judge who judges correctly, and you despise him who tells the truth. You don't want the truth. You'd rather have fake news because it goes along with your own ideology. You don't want the facts. Nothing's changed. <laughs> Nothing's really changed in the world. Who should seek him? Those who hate and those who despise. Who should seek him? Those who trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. There was a class warfare going on between the wealthy and the poor, and the poor were getting poorer, and the rich were getting richer. Has anything really changed? <laughs> Here we are again. Therefore, though you have built your stone mansions, you've been 
taking from the poor to make yourself rich. You're the living in luxury. That was the respectable sin that we saw last time. Living in your mansions, you will not live in them. You built them, but you won't live in them. You've, you've planted your lush vineyards. The vineyards and the wine was, was a symbol of prosperity. He said, but you will not partake in it. Why? Because disaster is coming, the Assyrian army. But if you would just hear the word, seek the Lord, seek the good, if you would just seek until you found them, they could all be averted. All be averted. You should seek him. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous, you take bribes, you deprive the poor of justice in court. It's all about me, 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 me. They were a selfie generation. And here we are again. Here we are again. Here's a situation. He says, therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet. Because if you speak up, cancel culture is going to put you down. That's what was going on. If you speak the truth and they don't like it, they cut you off from Facebook, Twitter, everywhere else, because you are speaking the truth and they don't like the truth that you're speaking. Guess what? This was going on then. In fact, we're going to see in the chapters to come that Amos gets cut off by, by the Israelites because they don't like what he's telling them, and he's telling them the truth. Therefore, the prudent man, he just keeps quiet. Why? He doesn't want to lose his business. He, he, he doesn't want to be the target of all the hostility. He says, in such times, for the times are evil. And God is going to bring his judgment about for the evil that is going on in the land. Hmm, maybe we should take heed as America for what has been, will be, for there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Seek the good, seek the good, seek the good. Finally, he says it, verse 14, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. You see, they came into church every Sunday, and, and they were saying, well, the Lord is with us, the Lord, the Lord is with us, the Lord is with us. But he wasn't, because they were going to Bethel, Gilgal, Beersheba. They are going to all these holy places. and thought, Just because I'm at the holy place, the Lord is with me. But he wasn't. But he's saying, now listen, if you just seek the good, you don't do the evil, that you may live. He said, and then I will really be with you. If you make it genuine in your life, I will be with you. I will be with you. So if you want to avoid disaster, you hear the word, you seek the Lord, you seek the good, and then you hate the evil. Hate the evil. That's what he says. Hate evil. I thought, I know what you're thinking, that you thought, you're not supposed to ever hate. That their hate, that, that's, a, that's a bad emotion. Actually, all of our emotions are good. It's how do we use them. How do I use? I'm not to hate my brother. Jesus said, do not hate your brother. Okay, don't hate your brother. But he says here, hate evil. It's not the emotion that is bad. It's what I focus it on. If I hate good, I am misusing my, my emotion. But if I hate the evil, then I am using my emotion the way God has given it to me. You see, all my emotions give me kind of a rush, an adrenaline rush to do something. And when I get angry and I get hateful and I get vengeful, that, that's an emotional rush to do something about the problem. And he's saying there's evil, so attack the evil, attack the injustice, attack the wrong, attack these, these things that, are going, that you're doing wrong, a false worship, a false religion, idolatry. Attack those things, hate those things. And then he backs it up with, oh, love the good. Love the good. I should have an affection for everything that is holy, just, good. 
and I should want to pursue those things. He says, maintain justice. Love that good. And he says, maintain justice. Perhaps the Lord Almighty will have mercy. When I repent and I turn from my, my evil and turn to the good, from my hate to the love, just perhaps the Lord will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph and upon me. So what's in this passage for me today? What's in it for me? You all know the verse John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When you believe in the Lord, he then says this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It was not God's mission to destroy us. It's his, it's his mission to save us. I can avoid eternal disaster by accepting Jesus Christ, his son. Seek the Lord, kind of like uh, the, the lay preacher saying, Look, 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 you're in big trouble. You need the Savior. Look unto him, all the ends of the earth. He's God, there is none else. John 3, 16, whoever, the whole world believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Because God didn't send him into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. But he says, then in the next verse, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. They are in the path of disaster, eternal disaster, because they have not believed. Because he has, sent, he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. What's in it for me? I can avoid eternal disaster. By seeking the Lord with all my heart, placing my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, taking him as my Savior and being forgiven of all my sins, having an eternal life, I will never be condemned with the world. I will forever have eternal life and in the presence of God. So, as that little graphic up there shows, in case of emergency, break the glass, get the Bible, the Word of God, hear the Word of God, Seek the Lord. Seek the good, the right thing to do. Accept Jesus. Hate the evil. Choose love. Let God so loved you. Choose the good. You can avoid disaster. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this passage. It is the word of the Lord. It is for us. I don't know what's in the path of anyone's day today. And David said, there's but a step between me and death. We could be driving home, a car just eight feet away on the other lane, have a mechanical failure of drive right into us, Lord, and, and we could meet you today. We need to be prepared. Avoid the disaster of eternal consequences by receiving Christ today. Lord, I know if anyone will right now call on you and say, Lord, I'm seeking you with all my heart. I'm accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. Lord, I'm choosing the good in Jesus, and I'm shunning the evil of my life. Save me, O Lord. You will hear their prayer, and you will save them for all eternity. Bless, Lord. Do this today. In Jesus' name, amen.